Welcome to today's eye review session. My name is Yejun Ho, a second year medical student at the University of Calgary. Our team will present to you today the keratoconjunctivitis, Sika, and other ophthalmic changes in rheumatoid arthritis as a link between ophthalmology and rheumatology. Rheumatoid arthritis is characterized by a systematic inflammation of the joints and it, it can also have extra-articular uh, manifestations, meaning um, symptoms outside the joints can occur characteristically with RA. And one of the organs where um, the RA uh, has this effect is the eyes. And specifically, eyes will develop disorders of the sclera, episclera, as well as tear production. So the lacrimal gland and their duct. So rheumatoid arthritis, as explained before, is a systemic uh, autoimmune disease characterized by polyarthritis. It is generally bilateral and symmetric, and uh, usually the joints present with pain, stiffness, and difficulty moving them, and the loss of the range of motion with the joints. And generally, when a patient has rheumatoid arthritis, on investigation, uh, they are associated with rheumatoid factors, or RF, and anti-CCP, or anti-cyclic citrullinated peptide antibodies, as well as inflammatory mediators, IL-1, IL-2, and IL-6. Uh, however, that does not mean rheumatoid arthritis has to occur uh, with the presence of RF or anti-CCP. This rheumatoid arthritis, as we will, uh, we will learn in the subsequent slides, uh, is frequently observed with extra-articular manifestations. The criteria for diagnosing rheumatoid arthritis exists, and it's created by American College of Rheumatology or, and the European League Against Rheumatism. Um, and the criteria involves the inflammatory arthritis, how many joints are involved, and the RF and the CCP testing that we talked about, um, and the acute phase reactants, CRP and the ESR, and the duration of the symptoms. As, um, this, there has to be caution, though, that rheumatoid arthritis can be uh, similar in presentation with other inflammatory diseases, like psoriatic arthritis, acute viral polyarthritis, polyarticular gout, and lupus. And if you take a look at this table here, um, there are joint, if you count how many joints there are, as well as the serology, a rheumatoid factor, and the anti-CCP antibodies, acute phase reactants, and the duration of symptoms, you can assign a score to each of the criteria, add them up. If it's six or above, out of 10, uh, this, is, this is called definite rheumatoid arthritis. So finally, here we are at the extra-articular manifestations of rheumatoid arthritis. What exactly are there? Now, before I delve into this, um, this, this slide does not mean that all the patients with rheumatoid arthritis have all these symptoms. Uh, this is just some of the, some of the um, symptoms that may be seen with this disease, and uh, these manifestations do not have to be present uh, for the patient to be diagnosed as rheumatoid arthritis. But that being said, some of the extra-articular manifestations include some of the uh, systemic uh, and B symptoms, like fatigue, malaise, poor appetite fever, and weight changes. And on the skin, there can be nodules, especially um, on the side of your elbow or uh, your knee extensor surfaces and the periarticular areas. The pressure areas uh, where the areas uh, and especially the joint parts that receive a lot of pressure and on tendons. And also uniquely, the nodules can form on the lungs, heart, and the brain. In terms of respiration, you can have chest pain and dyspnea, as well as ILD, interstitial lung disease. Uh, the heart can develop arrhythmia and pericarditis, or the inflammation of the sac, uh, sac that envelops the heart. 
Uh, neurologic symptoms include the carpal tunnel syndrome, the tight, uh, typically the tight uh, retinaculum uh, on your wrist. Uh, paresthesia, uh, which is a sense of tingling at your peripher peripheral limbs. Uh, senor weakness, uh, which is uh, the muscle at the base of your thumb. Uh, and also worse with activity or at night. Uh, the small vessel disease can include gangrene, rotting away of the flesh in extreme cases. Because of the inflammation, there is inad inadequate circulation around the periphery of the body. Specifically in the eyes, uh, they can develop scleritis and episcleritis, the inflammation of the outer layers covering the eyes. And also the eyes can develop Sjogren syndrome, which is dryness. So um, specifically, uh, there is keratoconjunctivitis sicca. Sjogren also implies dry mouth. And keratoconjunctivitis sicca uh, describes eyelids sticking together because of dryness. And this dryness uh, means the lubrication system is, has failed as well. So that every time you blink, uh, the the eyelid eyelids leave behind scleral and corneal abrasions, little scratches that can be very irritating and painful. The non-pharmacological treatment to arthritis includes a simple and healthy uh, lifestyle, such as rest, exercising, uh, physiotherapy is part of it, as well as occupational therapy. Uh, it goes to show that uh, you should eat right. You, you, uh, it never hurts to receive nutritional counseling. And also symptomatic treatments for um, all those articular as well as the extra articular symptoms. And because the uh, circulation is very important for the body, um, the interventions for cardiovascular, if the arrhythmia uh, is present. And Another, another uh, important point for arthritis is to screen for and treat the osteoporosis. This is because the chronic inflammation associated with RA, as well as the um, vascular insufficiencies that results from that, uh, are very harmful to the bone. And also the treatment for arthritis, which are which can be corticosteroid drugs, uh, all contribute to the uh, breakdown of the bones and the weakness and the uh, decline of the bone density. Pharmacological treatments for rheumatoid arthritis includes the famous DMARD or the disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs. Um, the example of that is hydroxychloroquine. But beware of the ophthalmologic vulnerability or the side effect of this drug. This can cause retinopathy, uh, overall decreased color vision, visual field defect, and this characteristic bullseye maculopathy. Look at this target-shaped pattern um, shown on the two uh, fundoscopy pictures uh, on, on the right. Sulfasalazine and methotrexate are also other other um, types of DMART. And the biologic DMARTs include the TNF-alpha inhibitors, infliximab, and the adalimumab. Uh, these are uh, synthetic antibodies targeted uh, specifically to our needs. Let's take a look at the anatomy of tear production. The tear is produced by the lacrimal gland, and after it covers the eye, it drains through the puncta, the caniliculi, and then to the lacrimal sac after which it drains to the nasal meatus. The tear forms a thin film on the surface of the eye, and this tear film is important uh, for several reasons. Uh, the first function that it performs is the lubrication of the eye. Because the sclera and the cornea is constantly at risk of exposure to uh, the external environment, as well as the constantly moving eyelids, uh, it's very important for the eyes to be constantly lubricated. This prevents any inf inflammation and irritation of the eye, 
as well as a corneal abrasion, which is very painful and is that and puts the eye at higher risk of infiltration by pathogens. The second function of the tear film is to maintain oxygenation to the corneal epithelium. Because the corneal epithelium does not have any blood vessels feeding it, it is important for uh, the atmospheric oxygen to continue to dissolve through a tear film, uh, which then can be fed to the, to that layer of cells. Uh, the tear film also acts to combat pathogens that keep sticking to the surface of the eye. Uh, it does this by first flushing the, flushing the pathogens and also having antibiotic effects where and by having some chemicals in the tear film, you can successfully uh, destroy potentially harmful pathogens. The tear film itself consists of three layers. The outer is the lipid layer, and this is produced by the meibomian glands. Understandably, this lipid layer slows the evaporation of the aqueous layer of the tear film, therefore, um, the lubricational effect lasts longer on the eye. The second middle layer is the aqueous layer and is produced by the lacrimal glands. This contains protein, electrolytes, and water, and also supplies oxygen that we talked about earlier uh, to the outer layer of the cornea. Uh, so essentially, this layer is a nutritional uh, supply layer for the for the cells. Uh, final and the innermost layer is the mucin layer and is produced by the crypts of Henle and the glands of Mans. This is also produced by the conjunctival goblet cells as well. And what we're seeing throughout this presentation is that patients with rheumatoid arthritis are at higher risk of um, having an impairment in that tear production anatomy and the drainage anatomy, um, and thus developing a keratoconjunctivitis sicca. The patients are at, especially at risk if they are female. Uh, the incidence rates of that is twice that of males, and also the age. Uh, the older they are, especially uh, between the range of 65 to 80 years old, they have a high risk of um, RA and conjunctivitis, uh, sorry, keratoconjunctivitis sicca. The lower socioeconomic status population also is at a higher risk of RA. And once they get RA, the financial burden for treating that disease is high, which leads to a vicious cycle. And lastly, smoking, alcohol, obesity, and the sedentary lifestyle are also risks for rheumatoid arthritis. So why would rheumatoid arthritis target the eye as well? Well, uh, it all has to do with the ingredients that the organs are made of. The sclera and the cornea contain high levels of these connective tissues known as proteoglycan and collagen. Uh, these these uh, molecules are also found in high amounts in joints. Uh, therefore, rheumatoid arthritis also has a higher chance of affecting the eyes as compared to other um, organs in the body. Uh, this leads to abnormalities to the lacrimal gland as well, uh, primarily because of its proximity, and this reduces the aqueous layer of the tear film. Uh, although there is still a lipid layer to uh, decrease the evaporation rate of the aqueous layer, uh, there isn't a lot of the aqueous to begin with. Therefore, the result is the quickly drying tear film and dry eyes. The, uh, because we discussed that the tear film's function is to keep the eye lubricated, um, the dry eyes are constantly uh, at risk of being irritated and developing corneal abrasions as well as infections. Because of the dryness of the eyes, there are multiple symptoms that appear in uh, the eyes due to rheumatoid arthritis. They, they can have foreign body sensation and also decreased visual acuity. 
and also photophobia because this involves active uh, adjustment of the eyes. It also causes itchiness, pruritus, burning because of the dryness, mucus discharge because of the higher proportion of the lipid layer, and episcleritis and scleritis as the surface of the eye gets um, irritated. So when examining the eye of a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, we might seem see some changes. Uh, we can first see mucous strands and debris uh, at the cornea and the sclera, aka the surface of the eye. The tear meniscus may be abnormal. So uh, when the light from the soot lamp is angled in a certain way, you may be able to see the concavity and the irregular and thin uh, nature of the tear film. And as illustrated in the top right picture there, uh, there may be froth at the margin of the eyelid um, near the end of the tear film. Keratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis cica is a clinical diagnosis and we can do some investigations uh, to reach this conclusion. And first of that is something called the tear film breakup time or BUT. Uh, we do this by first instilling fluorescein into the lower fornix, asking the patient to blink once, and then through the suit lamp, observe with the cobalt blue filter until black spots or lines appear, as demonstrated in the middle and the bottom uh, pictures there. Uh, normal uh, breakup time, time is around 10 seconds and above, 5 to 10 is marginal, and less than 5 means an unstable and abnormal uh, tear film. We can also try instilling the rose bengal dye onto the eye. And this dye is famous for ironically smelling very bad. This dye has an affinity for dead epithelial cells as well as to the mucus. So this is actually a good way to see the extent of the instability of the tear duct tear film, and also to see the damage done by uh, the dry eye symptoms. The final test that we'll cover is the Shermer test, and this is basically um, checking for the amount of tear film produced by putting a filter paper at the edge of the eyelid. Um, the filter paper is placed on the eyelid for five minutes and the amount of tear produced is quantified by how much the uh, tear stain travels along the filter paper. As you can see in the picture here, uh, around more than uh, 15 millimeters without anesthesia is normal. Uh, around 10 is slightly abnormal, possible shortage of tears, and less than 10 would be a conclusion for insufficient tear production. There are several options for the treatment of keratoconjunctivitis sica, uh, both pharmacologic and non-pharmacological. Um, first and foremost, uh, to preserve the tears, uh, we can idealize the environment. This includes reducing uh, the room temperature and also using room humidifiers to increase the humidity uh, in the environment and thereby preventing evaporation of the tear film. Uh, we can artificially administer more tears uh, via drops uh, like sodium hyaluronic, hyaluronate and povidone um, and gels and ointments may last longer uh, like the visco tears and the lacrylube. Mucolytic agents like the acetylcysteine 5% drops, uh, this may help break down any corneal filaments and mucus plaques but this may cause irritation and induce further damage to the cornea. Another method we can use is to reduce the tear that's being drained. And remember how I said the tears are drained through the puncta and then the canaliculi and to the lacrimal sac. Well, if you occlude the puncta, then there is, the tears will last uh, in the eye for a longer period of time. We can also choose to administer topical cyclosporin, which comes in either 0.05 or 
or 0.1%. And this is a well-tolerated and a safe new medication, which reduces uh, the inflammation of the lacrimal tissue. And lastly, uh, the oral cholinergic agents like pilocarpine can relieve the keratoconjunctivitis cica as well. Uh, but this is typically used for uh, xerostomia or dry mouth. For scleritis and episcleritis, um, the mainstay of treatment is to uh, treat the underlying cause or rheumatoid arthritis. So for recap, rheumatoid arthritis and ophthalmology is uh, quite closely linked. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis can cause systematic, systemic inflammation of the joints and uh, involve the eye as a part of extra-articular manifestations. Uh, this includes the inflammation of the sclera and the episclera, and also cause keratoconjunctivitis sica by affecting tear production. This is a flowchart summary of everything we've covered today. And these are the references of all the resources that we used to put this presentation together. Thank you for watching this video.